Good to be here tonight. Amen. God's still on the throne. Prayer changes things. Got a lot to pray about. Um, yesterday's, um, turn to John chapter 2, pardon my French, uh, John chapter 2, uh, Pastor Mike online yesterday, um, there was just, I don't know, it was, um, I've had this happen before, you get just something hit you. And um, the devil, in my opinion, my honest, humble opinion, his strength is increasing. The, the first Hulk movie they made, when he gets mad in his house and he turns into the Hulk and throws the guy out the window, you know, and he's out in the street and the guy starts shooting at him. Well, as they start shooting at him, he starts getting bigger and bigger. Don't shoot at the Hulk. Okay. So it's like he just increased the more you attacked him. And um, I have no doubt um, that his power, God is allowing him an increasing amount of power. Devils have an increasing amount of power. And that is something that we were told many, many times in the scriptures to watch for. Watch for these signs, these things that are going to happen. The way people are now, the way they react, the way they see things, the way they believe, and so on and so on. We know that there is no new thing under the sun, but definitely the things that are in our Bible are all going to culminate and come to a come to a point and it is called in the bible the evil day meaning that there's one of them there might be many little evil days less evil than this one great big gigantic evil day that's coming um and i think as god brings us through those that is God showing us that he will bring us through the evil day. But the evil day is coming. And there is just no doubt in, in my mind about it. Um, again, I don't, I don't have any confirmation on the thing that I presented yesterday uh, as a possible scenario. Other than the scriptures. I know the scriptures are right. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. And how I understand the world and how you understand the world may be two different things. So who's right and who's wrong, it doesn't matter. God's right. God knows what's happening. He know, He's in charge of it. And uh, to follow him and his plan, there is no greater thing in this world and no greater honor in this world than to follow the Lord. Amen. John chapter 2. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. We'll get right into the scriptures. Um, I, I've been so busy today with other things. I can't remember what I preached on last Wednesday night. So I don't know if I'm going to cover again what I covered last Wednesday night. But maybe you might enjoy it better if I do. All right. So just pray for us and pray for the word of God. Father, we love you and we thank you, Father, for this book. Father, great is thy faithfulness unto us. Thank you, God, for being such a merciful, good God to us. A God that hears our prayers, a God that blesses us, a God that has sanctified us. Father, for, for no return other than we trust you, we love you. And Father, no righteousness in our hands do we bring and offer any gold, any silver, any good deeds, any good works. We bring nothing to you, Lord, that you don't already have. Your mercy to us and your pardon of our transgressions and our sins, you've given to us because of your love. Father, teach us that kind of love. Teach us how to love one another the, the way that you love us. Teach us how to be loving neighbors to our neighbors. 
even people, Lord, we don't like or people we don't agree with, people that we right now don't love, teach us how to love them. And Father, these are stormy, stormy times we live in. <clears throat> and many, many rumors are going around the world and we don't know what to believe and we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how things are going to work out, but we trust your word. And Father, even at that, we don't see it the way it really is. We don't comprehend it. We don't understand all of it. But Father, you've given us the faith to believe and trust in it. And Lord, we pray, dear God, that that faith and that trust would go with us, teach us new things, Lord, that we need to know. Remind us of things we've already learned, Father, that, that will bless us. Uh, Father, many things that I've endured and gone through in my life, Lord, if, things that you just reminded me of that I thought I knew and I forgot about. So, Lord, just remind us of old things, teach us new things. We love and trust this book because there is no other book and there is no other source of truth. Bless your word tonight. Bless all of these that have come tonight, joined with us online. We pray your blessings on them. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. John chapter 2, verse 1. <clears throat> Let me see where I think I'm going here tonight. Yeah. John chapter 2. In the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. We know that she basically outlived her son we know that she was pre she, here, and here she is she's present at his uh, at, of course obviously present at his birth obviously present at his first miracle ever and or that one that we have record of this first uh present at his death uh we if i'm remembering right she was in the upper room with the disciples uh, on the day of Pentecost. And after that, we don't have really a record of what happened to her. I know what the Catholic Church says. Catholic Church says she ascended up into heaven because she was without sin. That is not what she said. She, when she heard that she was going to give birth to the Savior, she said, good, because I need one. That makes her a sinner. Amen. So anyway, but it, it, to me, it's just interesting that she is here present uh, with and Jesus does not at any time give her the reverence that the Vatican would have you believe that Jesus gives her to this day. And they teach that if Mary goes to Jesus with your prayers and Jesus has to do what Mary says, whatever Mary says, Jesus has to do it. That's nonsense. But anyway, the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Now I want you to think about the, the marriage, the blessing of the marriage that is coming our way. When the Lord appears in the air, we're going to be joined with him. That's the typology that we see here. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And again, no, I have never ever in my life looked at my mom in the eyes and said, woman, what have I to do with thee? Those words never came out of my mouth. I knew better. So he's not even calling her mother. And, and you look in the scriptures. He always has, addresses her as woman. Not mother. He does not listen to her prayers. And even at this time, she is making a request of him. But he's letting her know right now. You don't tell me what to do. You don't own me. I don't submit to you. I don't have to do what you tell me to do. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And so anyway, but she's going to, uh, we know that he's going to do the miracle. Look at verse three. I don't have that up on the screen, but I will have it in a minute. Uh, they, yeah, I do. Verse five, his mother uh, saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were uh, uh, set there six water pots 
of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. Give me your opinion on why there were, why does the Bible have to tell you there was six of them? What, what is that exact number have to do with? Okay. Why would there be six water pots? Maybe we'll investigate that. I'll give you a chance to think about that for a minute. There was set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. So we know that Jesus is going to, let's continue reading verse 8. He's going to turn this into wine. He saith unto them, now draw out now, bear it unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Now, number one, this is a miracle. What is this? What is the symbolism? What is the ideology behind the symbolism of turning this water into wine? Why did not Jesus? I mean, think about what he could have done. He could have sent, hey, Peter, remember that deal that time I told you to go look in the fish's mouth and get money out of it? Why don't you go get some money? And go buy, go in the store, go to the liquor store and buy us some more wine. By the way, there was a, a very heated debate in the former denomination of this church, the Free Will Baptist denomination. Um, and it was, it was, I don't remember all of it, but I remember part of it. They had asked one of the main professors at the main Free Will Baptist Bible College, what his opinion was of what this wine was. Did Jesus make and drink alcoholic wine? Now, I sat in this man's class. Um, I won't mention his name. I think he's now, he's, I think he's had to have gone on to the Lord. He was old when I was in his class. And I kind of liked him and I liked the class. It was, a, it was a, on the book of Romans. But anyway... He had made a statement in that classroom that he believed that Jesus did, in fact, make alcoholic wine and partook of that uh, somehow, some way. But he that he was involved in making liquor, wine, strong drink for this marriage. And from what I, I heard, so many different theories that this was a setup question. They knew this man, you know, had this opinion and they set it up and. They accused him of heresy and this, this one issue was used to start another Bible college, a competing Bible college against the main Bible college. So kind of like how church, churches split, they'll set something up, set the pastor up or whatever and wait for him to say something. Then half the church can get out and leave and say, we're going to start another church and on and on and on. That's how it happens. I do not believe that Jesus made fermented wine for these people the word wine in your king james bible words derive from places our words derive from places the word wine simply means from the vine the latin word vino it means it came off of the vine there are two types of wine in your bible there is fermented wine where yeast has been added leaven has been added to the to the grape juice after the grapes have been squashed. And um, then that's allowed to ferment. And the, you know what the leaven does? It eats the sugar out of it, turns it into alcohol. And people drink up, have a good time with it. I do not believe that this is what it was. The other type of wine, the Bible will not say the word grape juice. The Bible does not say the word Welch's. Okay. Or great value. Okay, it will tell you, it will say the word wine and you have, you must use the context of the whole of the Bible. You must use the context of what we know Christ would have done, would not have done, would have participated in, would not have participated in. These things all come into play on defining whether, whether this was wine where they were, well, that ain't, they were saying that it was the good wine. Were they saying that? 
Oh, this, this is the 50 proof stuff, not the 12 proof stuff. This is 25% uh, alcohol. This is better. What were they saying about it? I believe by the context of the entire word of God, Christ being who he was, a high priest, being, um, I believe Jesus was the Nazarite of all Nazarites. And I just do not believe that he would have made alcoholic wine for these people to get drunk. I just, I cannot accept that. You can throw Greek words at me all you want to in this. I just, I just, well, I won't believe it. So anyway, what, what is the symbolism of it? What was the water? Water is a symbol of something in the Bible. Water, of course, water in the Bible represents life. Where are they looking? They sent a, a space probe several years ago to the moon to look for something. They were looking for water on the moon. Why? There is a plan to build a permanent station on the moon for people to live. And they know that they must have water of some kind up there in order to make it work. If you have water, it, it, whether it's in the form of ice or whatever, they have the means to take that, to live off of it, make fuel out of it, hydrogen fuel, whatever. Oxygen is obviously in water, so they can do that. But water is a symbol of life. It's a picture of life. Look at your Bible, Ephesians chapter 5, turn there. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, look at what Jesus said. Think of, think of, um, think of baptism. I've mentioned this before, the number of stories in the Bible where water is present. Think of that, number of stories. David and Goliath. Where did David get the stones to kill Goliath? Yeah, they were river rocks. Got them out of a creek bed. Water seems to be present. Many, many of these types in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Even as, see, this is a marriage. This goes along with the symbolism, I believe, of this. We're talking about a marriage, husbands loving your wives. I've preached this. I try to practice it as, as much as is possible to try to show my wife the amount of love that she needs, the amount of love that she deserves, the amount of love that will keep her in love with me. It is my responsibility to love my wife. I stood here in this church, um, I can't remember how many years ago, but I can almost remember how many pounds ago it was. Well, I was a skinny young, young man, made a vow to my wife that I would love her, that I would cherish her, that I would keep her. We've almost forgotten in our day and age what that vow is all about. Amen. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Love, that's the definition of love. Loving is giving. Jesus, obviously, now he's at this wedding feast. Does he love these people? And think about Mary. Why, why was it that she went to Jesus? I mean, what is Jesus? Jesus is not the governor of the feast. He's not the one getting married. He is a, an invited guest to this feast. But there's something I believe that Mary knows about her, about her son. This man's unique. This man is special. She believed that this man was from God. Somehow, some way, she had it in her mind. I believe the Holy Spirit led her to ask her son, Jesus, can you do something about this for these people? Can you turn the, can, they need wine. Can you give it to them? He obviously, when you understand the symbolism of water and of wine in the Bible, you understand why I believe she's doing this. Anyway, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. When you look back at John chapter 2, notice that in verse 6, that's interesting, I hadn't noticed that. The, the number of water pots was 6, the verse is 6. To me, that it is interesting. There were set there six water pots of stone after what? What was the water pots 
and the water for cleansing, purifying. In the tabernacle, you had a, a laver. It's where we get the word lavatory, which basically means wash your hands when you're done. Amen. But they had a brass laver that before the priest could go into the holy place, he had to wash. He had to be cleansed. I heard uh, Pastor Kelly preach a message several years ago. I never really thought about this, but I mean, it was just pure wisdom from God. And he said, every sin in the Old Testament Levitical law, there was a sacrifice for that sin. Every disobedient, every time you disobeyed one of the commandments, a sacrifice was to be made. And yet... There wasn't a single sin in the Old Testament that did not, that was exempt from the requirement of someone being washed from that sin. When a woman goes through her time, she has a period of days whereby she is set aside and cleansed, but during that time, she must be washed everything in the bible that is dirty has anything part of this world must be washed and i am convinced that you have a lot of people living in this world who attend church would call themselves christians who have not been washed to them if it was a sin done a certain time ago, in their eyes, it doesn't count. It's, it's not a big deal for some reason, because I forgot about it. God probably forgot about it too. Well, let me tell you something. God doesn't forget. If it has not been the whole purpose of the sins being written down in the book, and then... Upon salvation, the sins then are blotted out of that book of transgressions, meaning that they have been wiped clean, like you would wipe a chalkboard. They have been wiped and washed clean. Everything must be clean. God is a clean God. Amen. God is a clean God. And you cannot clean. I need to take some people to uh, the Joachim Creek and show you what I used to swim in. When I was a little boy, there's a creek over here and I can remember dad and mom and then our neighbors, they had some kids and we'd go swimming in that creek. It was just as brown. It was just dirty water. We had a ball. Swimming in that. What we didn't know was that upstream from where we swam, there's a place and it's still there. They were making nuclear fuel rods there or storing them there. So if you ever want to wonder what's wrong with me on some days, maybe that was it. Okay. You cannot wash with dirty water. That's my point. You cannot wash with dirty water. It must be pure water. And that was the whole purpose of those, wa of those pots. Those, they were set aside for some reason for the, uh, for the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Back in Ephesians chapter 5, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. It is a good practice every day at some point to wash your heart. Wash, you're not washing your body, you're washing your soul. Wash your heart. The heart can become defiled by the things that you see in this world. We can, we can be desensitized to sin, can we not? 
Are there dress mannerisms, the way people dress now that were not accepted years ago? In fact, legally, legally, a hundred years ago in many towns in this country, there's certain ways you could not dress as a man or a woman. You just simply could not do it legally. And we have gotten very, very far away from that. Um, but anyway, be washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having what? Spot. The Watchman broadcast that's out this week, I think I've dealt with, again, the issue of the dot that Hindu women, and I don't know, maybe men do, I guess, too, adorn themselves with, they will place a, an ink dot on their forehead, they say it represents the universe. It represents the opening of the third eye. And that it is the channel by which the gods communicate with you. And it's how you can get the knowledge that the gods have to give you somehow, some way. But they put that dot, they will sometimes they'll adorn themselves with a jewel there. But it's called a bendy, and the literal interpretation of that word, literal translation of that word means spot or dot. It is the exact opposite of what we are to be as Bible-believing Christians. We are to be, what did James say? Pure religion and undefiled is this. A man keep himself unspotted from the world. Okay? Not, Jesus is presenting the church now to himself. He is the only one. That can wash away the sins. In fact, turn to Revelation 19. Since I'm rabbit hunting tonight anyway. Revelation 19. This is one of the differences between the King James and dirty Bibles. Because it says... Um, Verse 7, Revelation 19, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb. This is what we're dealing with, the marriage. The marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted, she was given permission to put this on. That she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. And what does it say? For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. The NIV translation and I would assume then that the other modern translations as well will say something in the, in the form of for the fine linen is the righteous deeds or righteous acts of the saints. That is a dirty lie. That is a horrible, horrible doctrine. That is a terrible doctrine. That teaches, that is, and I'm just telling you, when it comes to the gospel, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, if it's not said right in the right way, it is not the real gospel. The real gospel is we cannot perform righteous deeds. It is we are not capable of it. Even if we did, one sin would wash away all righteous deeds. One sin. So the King James has it right. It is not the righteous deeds of the saints. It is the righteousness of saints. That has been granted to us that we have been adorned with that Christ has washed us. He washed the spot off of us. So that now we can present our bodies a what? A living sacrifice. If the animal had a spot on it, could it be presented as a sacrifice? I don't care if it was just in the fur. If you brought a lamb... To the priest, and then had a little had a little black spot on its on its wool. Priest has to say, "We cannot." Yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. He's a healthy lamb. Doesn't matter. He's got a spot on him. I am not allowed by the law to to accept that. Take that back. Go bring me one that doesn't have one. You can eat that one. Eat it if it's a good one. Eat it. You, nothing wrong with it. But we cannot accept that as a sacrifice. Christ was unspotted from this world. Amen. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And I'm telling you, the only way to get there is through Christ and his blood. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. 
Let us draw near. Boy, I'm telling you what. I think God's dealing with preaching to me tonight. Let us draw near. Hebrews 10, 22, with a true heart. I've seen fake church people. I've seen them. There's no doubt all of us probably at one time or another been one. If you're going to, if you're going to be a Christian, be a Christian then. Don't be self-righteous. Don't be self-glorifying. Don't make it all about you. Draw near to God with a true heart. That means you come to God admitting and confessing your sins. Admitting that you've done wrong. Admitting that you are unclean. That you are spotted. That you are filthy. That, there is, that you, have terrible, you have a terrible disease in you called sin. Draw near with a true heart. In full assurance of faith. And this is what I was getting at yesterday. The Pastor Mike online. Let's just say that half or a third of what I read yesterday as a possible scenario that our president could do. Let's just say a third of that's true. Or even close to the truth. A storm will rise very quickly. Um, I did not watch any news today, but I was, I was told when I came in that they, the, the House of Representatives said, let's impeach him. He's going to be, something about that doesn't make sense. There's something we're not being told. If you have faith in what goes on on your television, you're wrong. If you have faith in CNN, you're wrong. If you have faith in Fox, you're wrong. I, I, like I said, I used to go to Drudge Report. I quit. There's a replacement place that I go to for news, but I see things on there that I know are not true. I know they're not. They just don't sound right they don't sound reasonable and whoever owns that website is skewed the other way i just don't trust these people but trust the word of god people trust this bible if for no other thing trust it to tell you where you're going to spend eternity Amen. having a foolish in full assurance of faith having a heart sprinkled from an evil Conscience and our bodies washed with what kind of water? Pure water. And I, I did not even mention this. Back in Ephesians 5, is the washing of water by the word. Those six water pots represent the Bible. And they represent the words of Jesus Christ. They are the water. How did, how did Jesus make a guy see? Bit. What was that? You know what the book of Proverbs says? I'm going to get this mostly wrong, but I'm going to paraphrase as best as I can. The words of a wise man's mouth are like a well of water or something like that. And even Jesus' spittle, it was symbolic of the, of the washing of the word. Because he told the man, he made mud and rubbed it in his eyes, told him to go wash it in the pool, and he washed it. He did it twice, and then he could see. Because it takes the Old and the New Testament together. That's why you do it twice. But that's the water of the Word of God. It's the Bible. Get alone with your Bible and read it, and let, let God wash out some of these ideas that have come to you from the world. That have come to you through the internet. That have come to you through the television set. That have come to you from neighbors. Or from people who have told you things. And you don't know if they're true or not. 
let, then go home and read your Bible and let God cleanse all that stuff off of you. Let him get it out of you. That's what I'm trying to say tonight. Deuteronomy 32, 2, he said, My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain. Upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass. We sing that song, Showers of Blessings. What's it talking about? It's talking about his doctrine, his words. The teachings of the Bible. Washing us and causing us to grow. Psalm 1, 3, he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water. The rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. If you're a tree planted by the rivers of water, you don't have to worry about it. There's always going to be water there. And it's to help us grow thereby. Psalm 42, 1, as the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. I'm thirsty tonight. I need a drink. Psalm 72, 6. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth. He shall get, look at what he said. He shall come down. Where did the, where did our Bible come from? Hell or heaven? Came out of heaven. It came down to us. The words of God came down like the showers that we need. Isaiah 12, 3. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. Water represents the word of God. And water has so many multiple uses just in life and in the Bible. We drink it, we wash with it, we dilute things. They call water the universal solvent. Dissolves things, you water things down or whatever. And it just has so many uses to it. But it's the blessing of God that he put us here and gave us water to drink. Amen. My throat is dry. You can tell by hearing it. Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Look at what he said. Behold the day. No, don't worry about it. I'll, we're almost done. Behold the days come, saith the I appreciate that, though. I really do. Behold the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Now, how true is this right here? Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And I have letters on my desk right now from uh, I, one of them I, I just read today. It said, we cannot find a clean church in our area. And I'm thinking that's very close to the words that she used. A clean church. Churches in our area are dirty or something like that or sick or something. So we can't find one. There isn't one anywhere. They're all having parties or they're whatever, not using the Bible. Nothing. There's nothing there. Give them the word of God. And there is a famine in, I would say, a vast majority of churches in this country, around the world. There is a famine for hearing the words of the Lord. First Peter 3.20 which sometime, he's talking about the angels that sinned, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was a preparing. Now this is interesting. One of the meanings of the number six is what? Preparation. Preparation. God is preparing. He uses that number. So in Genesis 6, he gives Noah the dimensions of the ark, tells him what kind of wood to use, how to put it together, where to put the windows at. And, he, and Peter then fills in this idea that he was preparing the ark during those 120 years. 120 is a divisible by six Okay, 60 times two, you could do it that way. But anyway, it, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Jesus, his first miracle that he does is a picture of, is a picture of salvation. It's a picture of washing. It's a picture of refreshing these people. Because like I said, he's not going to give them 50 proof Mogan David, 
wine. He's not going to give them alcohol. He's going to give them sweet wine. Good stuff that won't make you nuts. That won't make the, the best man grabbing the bride at the end of the party. Stupid stuff like that. Fights break out. I mean, I, God spared me from the drinking scene where you have parties and people get liquored up and all of a sudden Uncle Joe was dancing with some guy's wife and got his hands all over and a fight breaks out. God, God spared me from that. I didn't, but that stuff has gone on all around the world. Amen. So he wasn't making whiskey for these people. He wasn't making something to get them liquored up. He was making something that was going to be sweet for them. Next. Um, yeah, look at this. I, I think this is the last note that I have for tonight. Both Second Peter and Jude. Look at, look at both of these verses. Peter said that, that the false teachers were wells without water. Jude said that they were clouds without water. John, think about it. Down here and up here. Huh? That's where the flood waters came from, isn't it? That's where the devils come from. The devils are going to get pulled up from out of the pit, wells without water. They're going to fall down from the sky, clouds without water. See it? Isn't that something? Jude did not copy Peter. Jude did not say, ooh, Peter, that's good, but I'm going to steal that from him. I'm going to write that down. The Holy Ghost gave them both things to say. Okay, and it, it did not dawn on me until I put this together that they were like that. One of them was clouds without water. The other one was wells without water. Up high and down below. What does that mean? The false teachers will never teach you the Bible. They will promise to teach you the Bible, but they will teach you around the Bible. They will rest the scriptures, twist the scriptures. They will teach you other things that are not in the Bible. They will teach you their own doctrine about the Bible, but they will not teach you the doctrine. They are wells without water. They are clouds without water. And when you've got people that are thirsty enough, and they're sitting there listening to that stuff, they'll get up and walk out. And then they'll find, they'll look for a church that will give them water to drink. And there are still churches that are giving people water to drink. And I pray, I pray all the time that we are. That we are. I'm not, I'm not an expert on every subject that everybody wants me to talk about. But I love my Bible. And I love saying what it says. And I love telling you about these glorious things that are in it. And we're going to need these things. We're going to need them. We need a drink of water. Amen. Now, next Wednesday night, we'll talk about the wine. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful things. Oh, I love this Bible. Amen.